equipment and furnishings and we're also going to go through the cabin electronic system as well a bit later on um, so the first thing to say is I did mention it before is that um, in the Bombardier manuals 8825 covers really just the equipment and furnishings in the flight deck plus the ELT system all the other equipment and furnishings uh, which aren't you won't find in the Bombardier manuals are done at the completion center and there'll be a supplementary set of manuals issued by the completion center with all of the cabin furnishings in so that's the first thing so the the Bombardier chapter 25 is pretty scanty and has very limited information so first one first thing pilots and co-pilot seats so each seat is an inertia reel control uh, inertia reel and shoulder straps and a lap belt a crotch belt although that's optional and a quick release buckle pilot and co-pilot seats supply comfort and safety for the pilot and co-pilot and they're installed on two fairly standard uh, seat tracks the seats are four pairs of roller claw assemblies installed at the front and the aft of the seat to um, um, lock it in position and it can be adjusted fore and aft <clears throat> they are installed in the seat track rail and there are two bumpers installed on the seat back which prevents damage to the circuit breaker panel with, when the seat goes to the fully back position <clears throat> so we've got an inertia reel control system for the straps and, and that allows a pilot to change the inertia reel shoulder straps into a usual attached harness and there's a little locking lever on the side that allows them to do that when the lever is moved to the rear manual lock position operation of the inertia reel and shoulder straps remain in a fixed position the inertia reel control is on the rear inboard side of the seat and you can just see it there it says manual lock the shoulder strap is made of two lengths of nylon terrelene webbing stitched together to make an assembly with three ends so one end is attached to the inertia reel and then the other two ends there's a metal hook or loop uh, on the end of the strap which is used to buckle into the uh, quick release buckle so the lap belts they're also made from nylon terrelene webbings um, the forward end of the outboard lap belt also has a hook type fitting which is put into the quick release buckle and the aft end of the inboard and outboard lap belt has a hook fitting with a lock bar which is attached to the seat pan structure the lap belt length adjustment is made through self-locking loop buckles on the uh, strap the quick release uh, buckle is attached to the outboard strap of the safety belt it is used as a central point of, a, for, of attachment for the eye end fittings of the shoulder harness and the inboard strap of the safety belt the quick release buckle is a circular housing which includes a spring loaded lock unlock mechanism and a harness release that is uh, not attached the eye end fittings are automatically locked in when uh, put into the quick release buckle they are released when the unlock mechanism is turned in one of the two directions as we can see in the picture there they are released um, or sorry it's impossible to disengage the straps of the shoulder harness independently when the release lever is pushed in the forward direction the release lever is installed on top of the quick release buckle but you can't actually see it very clearly in that picture there so you can dis you can leave the lap belts part of it attached and just release the shoulder straps by using that lever which you can't see unfortunately okay we've got a couple of bits of miscellaneous equipment we've got a correction a compass correction card holder a column chart holder a cup holder and a map and checklist holder and you can see them all there We've got a portable fire extinguisher just behind the co-pilot seat and it's a pretty standard one nothing really unique to it for the Challenger it's just a pretty bit of, bit of bog, standard, bog standard equipment so adjustment of the seat we can adjust it to a height of six and a half inches from its lowest position 
with the operation of the height lock control which is all manual control actually all the controls on the seat are manual the height lock control is installed on the outboard side of the seat pan when the height lock control is operated a spring loaded lock pin is released and this permits the seat to move um, to the necessary height to adjust the fore and aft position of the seat the seat track uh, or the track and the primary lock lever which is installed on the rear rim inboard side of the seat is operated. When the track and primary lock lever are pulled through the first 30 degrees of travel, the, seat, the track lock pins are released from the holes in the seat track and you can move the seat from the fully forward position to the primary stop. When the lever is pulled through more than uh, 30 degrees to the full length of its travel, the primary lock pin is released and the seat can move to the fully aft position. When the track and the primary lock lever are released and the lock pins are engaged in the holes of the seat track, the seat position can be set to increments of one inch. The recline operating lever is on the um, rear outboard part of the seat and you, when it's operated you can recline the seat from 30 degrees from the vertical position. Okay, armrests. The armrest adjustment are uh, on the forward face of each armrest, a little thumb wheel underneath. The range of adjustment goes from 16 degrees down and 12 degrees up. The armrest itself can be set vertically for access into and out of the seat and then can go back into the selected position when you lower it down. support. The backrest cushion has an inflatable lumbar support. There's a shut-off valve that controls the inflation with ambient air as installed at the rear outboard side of the seat. The lumbar support can give approximately um, three and a half centimeters of adjustment. So we've got a couple of ELT options. Um, this one which is the Artex model 110-4 operates independently of aircraft power supply and transmits an emergency signal on two frequencies 121.5 and 243 megahertz the emergency signal can be switched on manually as well and is also and is also automatically triggered in the event of an impact the LT system consists of the following a transmitter unit an antenna and the control panel and also some kind of loosely associated components which will be the dimmer control unit so on the overhead panel there's an ELT switch there with um, an on an armed uh, position on the, on the switch the transmitter itself is in the aft equipment bay at station 687 and the antenna is just on the right hand side of the fuselage near the vertical stab at station 723. Inside the LT, it, it contains the 6D batteries, outline batteries, and, and these battery packs should provide power for the ELT for 48 hours of operation. So, for the system to work in automatic operation, the switches have to be configured as follows. So, the cockpit switch will be set to the arm position. And there's a switch on the uh, antenna, uh, on the transmitter itself that must be in the auto position. The transmitter is now armed for use, and it will operate automatically when you get a G loading on the ALT of more than 2G in 50 milliseconds. Uh, that will trigger it. The auto position must be selected at all times while the aircraft is operational. So that's the, the auto position is the position of the switch on the ELT itself. When the transmitter is in operation. There's an on light that comes on on the uh, panel next to the arming switch. To operate it manually, you put the switch on the control panel to the on position, and this will start activating it. Um, when it's again, when it's in operation, the on light comes on on the control panel. And by the way, if you do remove the LT from its mounting tray, then it will automatically deactivate the G switch 
which obviously stops it uh, accidentally being uh, activated during shipping. So to test it, you shouldn't do it for more, allow it to do the test for more than three sweeps of the distress signal. Um, so what you do, you tune your radios to 121.5, and then on the ELT control panel, you put the switch to on, and then back to arm within three seconds. You'll hear the, un you'll hear the undulating tone through the speakers for about three seconds. The on light... The on light will come on for the duration of the test, and then it will then it will go off. And then to reset the ELT, you put the arm switch to on, and then immediately back to arm, and that will reset it. So the other type of ELT you have is the 406 ELT. Uh, this one differs from the first one in that it transmits on an additional frequency, the 406 fre megahertz frequency, hence the name. Um, Broadly works the same. It looks physically different because you have two connectors, two antenna connectors, one for the 121 and 243 uh, ones and one for the 406 one. <coughs> two antenna connectors but a single antenna. The ELT antenna is a slightly different design as well. And this will transmit the normal distress frequencies 121 and 243 plus the 406, which is a satellite data transmission, actually. So just like the other ELT, it will automatically activate in the event of a crash. Um, actually, you'll notice that the uh, control switch is uh, different in a different location, different design, but it's got an arm, arm and on position just like before. Um, so an internal G switch will, will activate the unit when it senses a change in velocity of 4.5 feet, feet per second. And then when it's activated, it transmits on the 121.5 and 243 like before, but also the 406. So on the 406, it's transmitting data. So it will send digital information um, with um, the following information. So serial number of the transmitter, the aircraft ID, the country code, ID code, and if it's coupled to a uh, nav interface unit, which is optional, but most of them that have got this type of ELT will have the interface uh, unit, it will transmit the coordinate, uh, position coordinates from the nav system, from the nav interface unit. So the ELT antenna is a vertically polarized blade antenna um, on the top aft exterior of the uh, aircraft between stations 700 and 718. And the ELT is connected to the antenna via two coax cables, one for the 121.5 and 243 signal, and one for the 406 signal. There's also a buzzer that provides a distinct oral alarm when the ELT is uh, transmitting, and that's located next to the ELT itself in the after equipment bay. The ELT has got an on-arm switch. Uh, that was previously installed on the overhead panel on the other version. Um, the Artex one, the 406 model remote control panel, has been relocated and you'll now find it on the center pedestal. If you've got the nav interface option, this um, will also be installed in the aft equipment bay near the ELT itself and it provides the capability to send the position data, so latitude and longitude, to the ELT for its transmission on the 406 uh, frequency. And it also allows programming of an ELT 24-bit electronic address. The ELT unit, a nav interface unit, must be strapped with binary 1 bits tied to ground with the same 24-bit address as the ICAO or Mode S transponder system 24-bit address. So this will give you the, or the ELT, the ability to move from one aircraft to the other without the need for manual reprogramming of the ELT. The ELT also transmits a digital message which allows the search and rescue teams to contact the owner or operator of the aircraft using the database. The information contained in the database that may be useful in the event of a crash is basically the type of aircraft, the address of the owner, telephone number of the owner, the aircraft reg, and an alternate, an alternate emergency contact. 
So the advantage of a 406 transmitter is it gives you much more accurate position information, typically one to two kilometers compared to 15 to 20 kilometers for the 121 and 243 transmitters. Once the ELT is activated and the 406 signal is detected from the satellite and the position is calculated, the 121 and 243 signals are, can be used then to home in on the crash site. The 406 part of the transmitter operates for 24 hours and then it shuts down automatically to conserve battery power. The 121 and the 243 signals will keep transmitting until the battery is depleted. We're now going to take a look at something called the CES or cabin electronic system, which is a system that you may or may not find on your particular aircraft. But it provides a means of um, the flight attendants to look at the water system and, and control the entertainment system and so on. So not all aircraft have this system. Um, you should have some Rockwell Collins manuals I've put in with your uh, other course notes. And that's where this information is coming from. So we'll take now a look at the CES system. So at the centre of the cabin electronic system, is the something called the Modular Cabinet Equipment, MCE, the MCE 6000, which is basically a, mo a cabinet that contains various modules that host all the processing for the cabin entertainment system and the cabin electronic system. The uh, modules inside the MCE, we have a power supply module, a moving map equipment module, a PME processor mass storage equipment. We've got the Ethernet interface and Ethernet switch equipment module, um, which is an alternative to the JEE 6000. It replaces it. The PSE 6000 supplies power to each of the modules independently um, from each other. If there is a short interruption in power, input power to the PSE, the power from the modules can still operate for as long as up to 200 milliseconds. And this is because there's a capacitor in the PSE that continues to, to supply power to the modules for that brief period. The PME 6000 module does all the input output functions and contains a memory for the MCE. So therefore, the PME is a key element in the whole CES system backbone. The JE6000 module supplies an Ethernet uh, junction function. It supplies an Ethernet connection directly between the MCA external connectors and necessary Ethernet ports on the PME and the MME. The optional 6100 module, which replaces the 6000 module, supplies an Ethernet switcher stroke router, router function, and it supplies 24 local area network ports, 100, 100, 100, uh, 10 over 100 uh, base T Ethernet network as a primary system data bus. The optional ESE is installed in the JEE position in the MCE. So in other words, it's in the same position as it was as the 6000 module was. The MME 6000 stroke 6100 module, it's a moving map equipment, supplies a commercial Pentium processor based platform, which is suitable for hosting software applications, for example, the airshow moving map and passenger briefings. The zone distribution equipment supplies airplane passenger entertainment and office in the sky functions for the business traveler. The ZDE supplies distributed or multicast audio and video from um, DVDs, CDs, and has full browser functions in the uh, displays. The cabin management system standard equipment uh, includes the passenger and crew interfaces that control the CES. So we have, um, for example, some touchscreen equipment for the passengers. There's also one that the cabin crew use. Switch panel equipment supplies the passenger switch panel controls for the call lights, reading lights, 
um, and also provides uh, Ethernet, RJ45 and jack connections for laptops. So it's uh, physical switches basically for the passengers to control certain functions such as the call lights and uh, reading lights uh, and also allows them to plug in their laptop. The RDE 6000 is a relay drive equipment which supplies switched uh, relay and discrete potentials so that's either ground or 28 volts DC to control components in their related zones. The RDE has 14 relay outputs for control of PSU lighting and fans and 16 degree output uh, 16 discrete outputs for control of the window shades. Each RDE is connected to the ZDE by using a multi-drop serial bus. The RDEs provide seat belt and no smoking sign chimes and cabin call uh, ringer tone to the cabin speakers. The electronic flight bag is a very light compact screen and it supplies excellent optics, daylight readability, nighttime uh, flight capable dimming and touchscreen convenience. It takes 12 to 20 volts DC. We've got a VGA and a USB connection for the video and touchscreen. And the EFB provides a backup to the galley touchscreen equipment functions, if that wasn't working. The PME 6000 drives the EFB, EFB display. The EFB software resides in the PME module inside the MCE. The Galley TSE serves as the main uh, CES built-in test and diagnostic interface. The Galley TSE controls all of the following functions. I won't go through them all. You can read them at your leisure. But um, the call system, the galley systems, the, toilet, the water system, passenger audio control. They've got the master control for the cabin entertainment system. They can control all the cabin lighting from there, the cabin temperature control. They can control all the window shades. Um, they control the passenger briefing system, the interactive maps, and um, when there's an incoming fax, it gets enunciated on there. And basically, there's a, a 3.8 TSE. TSE is touchscreen equipment. It's basically just a touchscreen. Um, and uh, they can control what, who the master seat is. In the in the cabin, there's there's kind of normal seats, and then there's VIP seats or master seats. And the master seats have uh, are given more control over systems. So, for example, the master seat can control the um, cabin temperature. Okay, uh, only the master seat can do that. All the other seats can't do that. And so the the galley touchscreen system can um, equipment can can allocate what the master seat is and even take back control and basically inhibit the master seat as well. The digital tapping equipment receives and decodes all the video inputs from the ZDE, so ZDE is zone distribution equipment, for the right hand touchscreen equipment and the left hand touchscreen equipment, equipment and the PNS preamplifier. Uh, the DTE encodes the video inputs from the cabin TSEs and uh, sending it to ZDE2. The um, IRE6000 infrared remote control, also known as Pronto, is a colour touchscreen remote control unit that interfaces to the IIE6000, which is the IRRF interpreter equipment. The Pronto transmits the RF uh, remote control codes to the interpreter. The interpreter generates the source equipment codes in response to a push key on the um, on the remote control screen and the uh, interpreter outputs then the control signals to the DVD and the CD players. So each passenger seat has a touch screen that controls the audio and video, video source selection and for the master seat, the source equipment controls. The uh, DVD player sends video and analog audio output to over the Ethernet as part of the entertainment system. And the player can play DVDs, MP3s and audio CDs.
So in the cabin we've got this bulkhead display equipment which is basically an 18.1 inch flat, uh, flat panel display and it displays a distributed uh, video from the standard DVD and CD players and also has full browser capabilities. Um, so we've got some options here. The, you can have a larger display screen, a 21.3 inch flat display screen and like the other one it displays the content from DVD and CD players with full browser capabilities. Um, another bit of optional equipment is the uh, something called the TW300 Tailwind uh, Satellite TV system which allows you to broadcast um, or to receive digital broadcast satellite signals which will then give the passengers access to a full spectrum of satellite video and audio programming. Obviously a subscription will be uh, required. So this is the uh, summary then of the baseline system, <clears throat> the basic system in other words. So you've got a galley touchscreen that controls the cabin, entertainment, air show, the airborne office and provides some maintenance functions which we'll go through later. <clears throat> the passengers have got, uh, each of them have got a 3.8 uh, inch uh, touchscreen where they control their um, audio and uh, entertainment sources and including one for the master seat which gets, gives the him some extra control such as a cabin temperature uh, there's a cockpit uh, touch screen which gives the crew charts where they control the cabin there's some shortcuts there, status, manuals and um, door operations We've got our Pronto remote and then those local switch panels for the lighting controls and the call lights. Then we get the upgraded versions. So we've got a larger screen, so 10.4 inch master seat touchscreen uh, and the 10.4 inch normal passenger touchscreen. Um, all the functions are the same, it's just the screen's a bit bigger. There's also um, uh, an improved remote control unit that uses wireless rather than um, the infrared and then of course the pilot and co-pilot have got their um, touch screens still. The galley touchscreen controller gives uh, the cabin crew access to the water system so they can purge the water tank from there, they can look at the water levels, they can also control the cabin lighting and uh, control the master uh, entertainment system including the air show and the airborne office menus and there's also a maintenance area there where you can view fault messages relating to all the uh, cabin electronic equipment. The master seat touchscreen gives the master seat person control over a whole range of function obviously his own personal entertainment system plus the main entertainment system from the master sort of CD player, the master DVD player, the air show, the XM radio plus any of their own personal equipment that they've got connected including um, control of the airborne office and uh, cabin, temp cabin temperature, cabin lighting and the window shades. The 3.8 inch and the 10.4 inch passenger touchscreens uh, allows the passengers to select both audio and video entertainment sources including CDs or DVD content and the 10 and a 10.4 inch passenger touchscreen also provides passenger control of the audio volume and tone output to the headphones connected to the local headphone jack. This remote control replaces a normal Pronto remote, uses different technology, the Pronto uses infrared, this uses a wi wireless uh, connection, so it needs a wireless LAN unit and an Ethernet switch, but broadly the controls and functions of this remote control unit are, are pretty much the same as the Pronto one. The cockpit TSE contains seven menus including charts, weather, and door and uh, manuals. The cabin menu 
um, when you push that, it basically now the co cockpit touchscreen controller is acting as a backup to the galley touchscreen controller. These are the menus you've got available for the galley touchscreen system. So you've got uh, you can do briefings from here. You can do <clears throat> you can look at the water menu, the galley menu, lighting control, shades control. There are certain presets that you can set up. And then there's the message menu. So this is the water menu <clears throat> from the galley touchscreen. Um, so we can turn on and off the water heaters. We can purge the tank and also purge all the lines. And we can also see the uh, contents of the water tank. The galley sub menu just really gives you control of the galley area lighting and also to control the galley um, exhaust fan and the entry heater mat at the uh, cockpit entrance, uh, not the cockpit entrance, the pa passenger entrance. The menu controls the cabin lighting where you can adjust the cabin upper lights and the lower lights. Pressing the link button links the upper brightness and the lower brightness together so you can just control them both from one single single selection and then down at the bottom you've got all an all on switch and an all off switch the miscellaneous tab within the lighting menu controls some additional lights so the cabin accent lights the lavatory lights and the baggage compartment lights plus all the reading lights you can turn them on and all the table lights you can turn them on and off on some installations you might find that you've got an additional tab, a forward and aft tabs, to split the cabin light into, into a forward part of the cabin and an aft part of the cabin. The shades menu just simply controls the, uh, the window shades and you can just control the left and right sides or both and put them up and down. Once again on the split cabin option they divide it up into forward and aft. So you can set the forward or aft ones up and down. The preset um, menu gives, from a single switch, you can set certain defects. So, uh, for example, um, lighting settings for power up, for boarding, for cruising, for movie viewing, or for landing at night or in the daytime. And finally, the messages menu um, displays the messages, so incoming faxes, check config messages, or check maintenance messages. So all of what we were just talking about was we were we were in the cabin top level menu. Um, at the top of the screen, you'll see some tabs: cabin, entertainment, air show, office, and maintenance. Um, all what we were talking about just now was in the cabin top level menu. The next one along is entertainment, so when you go into the entertainment you get, you get a whole load more options coming up and you can set um, the video uh, parameters so you can choose what's being displayed on the forward and aft bulkheads and then when you go to the audio tab you can set up the um, audio system, so set the graphic equalizer, volume levels and so on. So this is the audio tab in the entertainment system, in the entertainment setting system. So you can set your speaker audios, what the source is, the balance, the volume, and also equalizers. So for different settings for whether it's rock music, classical music, and so on. In the fault messages, uh, sorry, in the maintenance messages or the maintenance tab, we can look at um, the basic status of all your systems and LIUs, and you can also display fault messages. In the diagnostics um, sub menu, that provides more detailed information from the central maintenance and diagnostic function. These menus are, are for use by maintenance people to evaluate the system and diagnose any problems. The diagnostic menu has the tab screens and uh, subscreens that follow. So you've got faults um, displaying as a sub menu current and historic faults, 
and end configuration. So the faults um, menu <coughs> split up into current faults and historic faults, but that would show you any fault messages related to individual LRUs and the options that you've got in the um, fault or the warning field are um, failed, failed stroke wiring, off stroke no output, overheat, LRU OK stroke info, deferred maintenance and maintenance. If you click on the show details um, uh, option on the previous page, then it opens up um, a bit more detail information where you can view um, the detail of the fault. You can also look at variable inputs. So you can look at, um, it's looking at the parameters, if you like, and variable and will display them. And, and you'll be able to see there if there's any faults. The HST tab, which is the global office um, menu, um, this is where you can set up your uh, global office, including setting passwords and usernames, etc., etc. So, if you remember back, casting your mind back to the lights menu, one of the options you had in the lights menu was to to push a button and it goes to certain default light settings, like there was a power up default. Um, well, in here under the maintenance uh, tab and then the system sub tab. This is where you can set those uh, default settings. Um, this area is password protected, but you can set the default uh, lighting levels, you can set the default um, entertainment volume levels and so on, and what's the default player and so on. Um, so that's where that's done. The CES maintenance screen supplies the ARINC 429 bus status and discrete status for each of the MCE configured within the CES system. The cabin entertainment system, sorry, cabin electronic system components can be powered up in any order or all at the same time. However, the following procedure will result in the most consistent uh, system startup. So with the cabin power switch on the overhead panel switch to off, turn on aircraft power, wait for the touch screens uh, the cockpit touchscreens to display their start page. Turn on the cabin power switch on the overhead panel, and then the cabin touchscreen screens will now come alive and be ready to use within five to ten minutes, as soon as the start page displays. To power down the cabin electronic system, so before you turn off power to the cabin electronic system components. Set the cabin components, such as the electric shades and water system, to the proper shutdown setting, or in other words, where you want them to be. Eject any tapes or discs that are needed from the entertainment system, because once you've powered this system down, the individual components are not going to work, and you'd have to power the whole thing up again if you needed to get a disc out, for example. Make sure that the galley system, so the water and waste systems, and the main cabin lighting are no longer needed. Once you've done all that, the CS components can then be safely powered down at any time or in any order. Set the pa cabin power switch on the overhead panel to off before you turn off aircraft power. Obviously, once power to the CES is switched off, those systems will no longer be working. 